It's my pleasure to introduce Roman Yaplonsky. Hey, Louisville. So you guys made it to the last talk of the day. I understand I'm the only thing standing between you and lunch, dinner, food, whatever it is you haven't had yet. Uh, you're also probably the biggest audience I ever had a chance to put to sleep. <laughs> so I'll start by telling you the same thing I tell my students. I'm a professor at the University of Louisville. I tell them you can follow me on Twitter. You can follow me on Facebook, but you can't follow me home. <laughs> it's very important. So a lot of times people have an outline for their talk. I really hate that. It's pointless. Just get to the talk. Tell us what's going on. So here's my outline. I'm going to tell you what superintelligence is. Maybe it's not all positive, and maybe there are things we can do about it. So before I start telling you things which are very controversial, I'll tell you some things we can all agree on. I'll tell you that artificial intelligence is here. It's in your phone, it's in the cars, it's uh, Google, it's every bit of technology we are using here today. Sometimes in AI research, then we succeed, we stop calling it artificial intelligence. So then we started projects like Spellchecker. It was an AI research project. Now that we have it, it's no longer AI, it's a tool for spell checking. So in your head, maybe those techn technologies are not AI, but they very much are. Additionally, I can tell you that robots are here. You may not see them every day in your you know, daily commute, your work, depending on where you live. If you're in Japan or Silicon Valley, you might see more of them. But we know how to make them. We fund a lot of research into designing robots. And, um, we're getting some really good results in terms of robots uh, who can assist us, uh, robot soldiers, rescue robots. So I'll say robots are here as well. But the question is, what is next? What is coming? And I'll argue that next is uh, superintelligence, intelligence beyond human level. Why do I think that? There is a number of projects which are funded at a level unprecedented before, billions of dollars or euros, to reverse engineer a human brain, European projects, American projects. There are conferences devoted to this now. And of course, there are private companies, corporations, which have some of the brightest people in the world working to solve those problems. Given funding, given intelligence involved, It'd be very surprising if they didn't succeed at some point. How soon will they succeed? I don't really know. It's really not that important for what I'm going to tell you next. It could be 10 years, 20 years, 50 years. The conclusions are the same. I like uh, work Raymond uh, Kurzweil is doing on predicting uh, such events, extrapolating technology, Moore's law, uh, basically saying that once we get to computational power equivalent to that of human brain, there is no reason why we can't have that level of intelligence. So he puts the dates on 2023, 2045 range. I tend to agree with him, but again, it doesn't really matter how soon it's going to happen. The important thing for me is to convince you that it will. So, what are the properties of those systems? Well, by definition, superintelligent systems are super smart. Those of you who had a chance to attend the Trivals conference uh, on rise of AI, maybe heard uh, Ken Jennings talk about how he was uh, essentially a victim of automation. Machines took his job. An amazing guy, very funny speaker, greatly enjoyed him. Uh, IBM Watson, dominated him, the most knowledgeable, most intelligent person, a uh, winner of 74 uh, Jeopardies, like uh, he was nothing. The, the competition was incredible. Same thing in other domains, in chess, in uh, 
Well, pretty much anything. Once we devote a few years of research, humans go from being superior to machines to being about the same to not even being close in performance. In addition to being super smart, machines are super fast. They're so fast, you don't even have time to realize they already made a decision, acted on it, the game is over. Specifically in stock market, there are now events which are so fast, no human can keep track of them. We're talking about nanoseconds, milliseconds, uh, those extreme, super uh, fast events. And then you have enough of them, it really impacts the whole economy. If you remember, we had a flash crash in 2010 where machines basically sold the stock market. We lost trillions in value in a matter of hours. And this is only getting worse. What else are those devices? They are super complex. The source code itself could be millions of lines of code. The way they interact with us, the interface to people is super complex. We're going to have a panel with experts on airplanes. I'm not one of them. But this is a picture I found just Google airplane instruments. Look at the complexity. How is it possible for a pilot to not only not make a mistake, but exercise all those possible instruments, values, sensors, code in all possible circumstances? Even a well-experienced pilot will deal with situations where they've never seen something like that before. Completely novel situations, leading to very dangerous, sometimes fatal results. Those machines are also super controlling. I mentioned stock market. Majority of trades, over 70-80%, is now done by machines, not human traders. Machines also control nuclear power plants, power grid, satellites. Pretty much all infrastructure we have is now automated. And the complexity of controlling those devices is such that we can't reverse the process. We can't take the control back. We lost it. What type of devices can we see produced with those abilities? So the number one founder of AI research is military, DARPA. If they are funding AI research, what are we going to produce the most? Soldiers, drones, uh, all sorts of military-related devices. So that's one thing to keep in mind. The first and most advanced technology will be probably for military use. We also see emergence of super-intelligent viruses. They're not quite more intelligent than a human hacker, but they're getting closer and closer. In terms of damage they cause, we're looking at billions. In terms of number of machines they impact, we're talking at millions of machines. And you can see the trend. It's growing, it's getting worse and worse. Think about a virus with human level or above capability. Think about the damage it can cause. And of course, there is work, automation of work. We've been losing physical labor jobs for years to automation. Now we're starting to lose intellectual jobs, highly paid jobs, jobs for which you need to have a lot of training, college degrees. Why? Employers love robots. They love AI. You don't have to deal with sick days, vacations for 1K. Sexual harassment is not a problem most of the time. Though I hear there are now robosexuals out there, so I cannot guarantee that. <laughs> so there is a good chance most of us will be out of a job. People developing those systems will probably be the last ones to lose jobs, but they will also go at some point. I mentioned a few negatives, a few possibilities. I'm not saying there is not going to be an amazing positive impact from those machines. We'll probably cure cancer, AIDS, we'll develop unified theory of physics, we'll have huge bloom in economy, trillions of dollars of wealth will be generated. There are things I can't even think of, the unknown unknowns of positivity which will happen. But I don't feel like we need to spend a lot of time talking about it. Because if it's a good thing, we don't need to get ready for it. If you find $100, you're ready. 
If you lose money, now you need a backup plan. Things are not so good. So what are the negative impacts of this technology? I mentioned losing jobs will be outsourced. Uh, there is possibility of lo uh, losing rights, human rights, civic rights. Obviously, I mentioned military applications, uh, different types of wars, more deadly wars. And again, that unknown, unknown situation. Unknown unknowns. We don't know how bad it could be or what could happen. I have this slide here inspired by work of Eliezer Yudkowsky on a space of mind designs. What it is supposed to show you is just how huge is the space of possible different intelligences. We frequently talk about diversity of people. We have different cultures, different languages, different genders, races. But if you think about it, we are all almost identical. Most of the time, we want very similar things. We are all products of biological evolution. So if you think about it, we are that tiny dot in a space of possible designs. We can expand the dot of a biological intelligence as animals. We can think maybe aliens exist. But the overall design of things which can have intelligence is huge, infinite almost, probably completely infinite. Depending on how AI is designed, is it created from scratch? Somebody wrote a program. Did it evolve as a genetic algorithm? Is it a simulation of humanity based on upload of somebody's brain? Or some other completely unknown method at this point? They can have completely different mental capacity. Obviously, they are more intelligent. But also, they have different desires and completely different common sense. Things we all as humans would immediately understand and agree on would be very different for machines. So it's something I call singularity paradox. We have machines which are obviously super capable, super intelligent in most domains, but they are like little kids in some situations. So Ken Jennings spoke about the question in Jeopardy, and I love that example. The question was about US cities. You guys probably remember that. And the system, the super intelligent system with complete access to internet, no everything system, said Toronto. That was the guess. A mistake no human would make, but this machine felt it was appropriate in this situation. So if you take common sense, human common sense, out of decision making, you have a system in charge making very important decisions about all aspects of our life, nuclear power, stock market, you name it, but it has no common sense. Can this be dangerous? Maybe. So there are now books coming out. In the last couple of years, we've seen a number of books, buy my book, uh, <laughs> come out which talk not just about positive impact of AI. Kurzweil always talks about how great things are going to be. We're going to live forever, have all those cool things. But also speaking of, well, can it be somewhat dangerous? Can we have some problems with it? I'm a computer scientist. I'm a director of cybersecurity lab. I've been doing research in this area for five, six, seven years. And I've been speaking on it, trying to bring awareness to issues. And nobody cared. Nobody listened. Until this year, a few people, a car sales guy, a guy selling really terrible operating systems, a <laughs> physicist, unemployed guy, all said the same thing. <laughs> and all of a sudden, everyone agrees with me. It is beautiful. I love it. And I'm, of course, joking. Those are brilliant minds, uh, very successful, and a lot of them are now funding this type of research. In fact, some of my funding comes from uh, Elon Musk uh, to do this type of work. And we as humanity realize there is a risk. In a matter of a year or two, we have this amazing response now. Organizations born out of nowhere, now at Oxford, Cambridge, MIT, Berkeley, the best schools in the world feel this is a very important problem to work on. It's legitimate. There are conferences, grant funding. We are no longer playing science fiction, fighting Terminators. We're doing very important research. So to start this work, we need to figure out what has been said about it, what can we do, where should we go with it. 
me and a colleague of mine put together a survey of everything ever said on this topic up to that point. Hundreds of papers reviewed. We analyzed it, classified it, and it's available for free. It's open, you don't have to buy it like my book. But take a look. It's really a wonderful article to get someone with no background knowledge up to speed and what the state of the art is in controlling intelligent machines. As I said, it's hundreds of papers, a lot of things. I have 14 minutes left. I'm not going to tell you about most of them. But I'll give you some highlights so you get an idea for, one, how horrible some of those ideas are, and two, how difficult the problem is. So this was a common solution. I don't have anything to show you. It's a do-nothing solution. <laughs> uh, people say things like, we're not going to build AI. It's too difficult. Uh, if we build it, it's going to be thousands of years away from us. Not now, not soon. I don't have to worry about it. Maybe machines will be super nice, and we don't have to worry about them. <laughs> or maybe they'll kill us all, and it's just natural progression of evolution. We should let them. So I don't like this do-nothing approach. There are those who said, it's a super problem, we can't solve it. The only thing to do is to stop development of technology. Do you guys recognize who that is? Kaczynski. So some say Unabomber, some say Professor Kaczynski, Harvard graduated uh, mathematician, brilliant scientist. It depends who you listen to. Um, <laughs> so clearly his solution was not something I favor. I'm an AI researcher. I don't want to be bombed. But uh, his approach was, and he published it in his manifesto, to do whatever it takes to stop research in advanced AI. There are solutions which say, well, let's just treat technology like we treat each other. We'll give them laws, legal uh, framework. We'll give them financial incentives, uh, make them part of our economy. I don't really understand how that would work. There are certain things you can do to people which you cannot do to robots or software capable of copying itself. So things like punishment, for example, is not really obvious to me how that could work in this domain. Other people are saying, yes, we're going to become better than us, but what if we kind of build up and become competitive? We can do genetic engineering, we can upload our brains to computers, become as smart as they are, remain competitive. It might work in some way. My opinion is that by uploading your brain into a computer, you become a program. You become non-human in the traditional sense. So I'm not sure it's a solution we are satisfied with. There is also an interesting variant of basically what I would call religious argument. This is just a test. We're here to see if you are a nice person, if you're not, we'll punish you severely. If you're good, we'll reward you. We are your creators. Do what we tell you. So basically, we fool the machines into thinking they're living in a simulation, matrix or something reversed. Um, just like religion, is not the perfect solution. There are certain people who choose to disobey religious authority, and likewise, we'll probably have some uh, intelligent machines not agreeing to worship inferior beings. This idea of religious approach is not limited to what I just mentioned. If you think about Ten Commandments, that's what three laws of robotics are. A while ago, I checked with Siri and what it thinks about the three laws of robotics. That was the answer I got. The thing is, you need to realize that this was used as a technique to write interesting books. It was designed to fail. It's not a real solution. It is a terrible solution. The laws contradict each other. It's easy to break. Uh, a standard human lawyer can find loopholes in laws. A super intelligent lawyer can destroy all of them. So if you're ever talking about safety for AI, safety for robots, please don't mention three laws of robotics. It is really bad. There are some mathematical solutions we can try. So we're starting to be better at verifying software, proving it to be correct, especially in critical applications. Control of satellites, nuclear power plants, we'll talk about planes in a minute. Um, problem is, we don't know how to verify 
intelligent behavior in novel domains. We know how to check if the code is written according to the design, but we still need to learn how to do this next, much more challenging step. This is one of the solutions I'm a big fan of. I'm working on something like this. And that's the idea of trying to limit access an intelligent system has to the outside world while we're testing it, debugging it. We don't want to just let it go on the internet and see what happens. We don't want it to control anything outside of its system. So we are spending time developing communication protocols which limit possibility of social engineering attack. If you guys seen some recent movies uh, about AI escaping, this is what I'm talking about. Um, it allows us to reset the system, delete information about the programmer, about the user of the system, so there is less chance again of the system trying to escape using this knowledge. Uh, I'm not going to go into additional detail again, uh, time constraints, but this is uh, something I publish on a lot, and you can get those papers for nothing. So overall, we as society, as scientists, agree that there are certain topics which are unethical to research. Biological weapons, chemical weapons, maybe nuclear weapons. There are some experiments we shouldn't run. We shouldn't torture higher-level animals, lower-level animals, children. Human cloning sounds incredibly useful to do, accomplish, but we decided we're not ready yet. We're not doing it because we're scared of side effects, consequences we might get from it. I'm arguing that certain type of software research, advanced AI research, might be kind of like one of those things. Some people actually said that advanced AI is as dangerous as nuclear weapons. Now I'm starting to think it's an understatement. So then we talk about typical research path to a complicated project. Most likely, success will come from governments, large corporations, universities. In that context, review boards, which decide on funding, decide to give permission or not give permission, are a great way to control what's happening. Of course, with AI, we don't know how difficult the problem is. If it turns out to be super easy, some kid can do it in his basement on a laptop, then this doesn't work. But it looks like it might be somewhat challenging. So it's a good idea to have standard science controls in place for AI design. One approach a lot of people suggest, and this is probably the only slide I have with a bunch of bullet points, I try to avoid them here, just to show you how many people proposed, let's take human ethics and encode them in a robot. Of course, the ethics I proposed are the right ones. Uh, we don't usually agree on common ethics. If you ever traveled outside of Kentucky, Outside of US, you see different cultures, you see different concepts of what is ethical, what is moral, what is good. If we decide on one of those and just implement it in our supervisors, uh, most of us will not be happy with the results. So I suggest kind of having this continuum of uh, AI research problems. Developing tools, spell checker, calculator, sounds like it's a good idea, it helps us a lot. Maybe we should kind of do the same thing we do with human cloning with advanced superintelligence, which can actually learn on its own and put us out of business. So I would say this type of work at this point is unethical. So that brings me to the conclusion. What do I want you guys to take from this? Great power corrupts absolutely. We heard this in different variants applied to people. It works the same for other types of intelligence. We already give control over most of our physical infrastructure to machines. We are not getting that back. I want to make sure that we don't put machines in charge of deciding who lives, who dies, what is good, what is bad. Certain functions should not be passed on from our hands to machines, which I remind you have no common sense. So that concludes my talk. If you guys want to learn more, I'll be signing books pretty soon after the panel. If you don't want to pay for the book, you want to get the same stuff for free, you can get those papers. Most of them are available on my website. Uh, you can Google them. But of course, you want to support research, which will save your life. So you'll <laughs> buy the book.
And I'll repeat, uh, if you want to find out more, I'm happy to respond to emails, comments, questions. I can use extra 600 followers on Twitter. Please go ahead and uh, join me, at least online. I think this is all I have, and uh, we'll answer questions during the panel. Air France. Air France. Why don't you sit here? Great job. All right, I'm going to ask um, uh, Ginny Wu and S Scott Kimmel uh, to join us. Yeah, he's my brother. That is if he can find his way out here. Um, have a seat. I'm going to do a brief introduction to them. And Jenny is um, her most, one of her most recent uh, undertakings. She's a uh, cognitive psychology student in a PhD program at the um, University of Notre Dame. Scott, who is my younger brother, as you probably can tell, um, um, because he looks so depressed, is, uh, is a, uh, he's in the financial services industry uh, and uh, investments, but also in his er earlier part of his life, he was a 727 and 737 captain on, for a major American commercial airline. So we're going to talk about some of those things. So I want to start out by asking Jenny, um, from the standpoint of what Roman was talking about. What's your, your thoughts on, and again, questions, please feel free to go to the mics. Um, it seems to me one of the big unknowns, one of the big interesting issues is just how we as humans relate to these machines. I mean, we're already relating in ways with our smartphones and Siri and all those kinds of things. So what, what are, your, what are your, your thoughts on that and what are some of the obstacles you see to that? I think there's two points um, that I would stress in thinking about that issue. One is the fact that technology, one of the huge benefits of it is that, of course, it's a tool for a vast number of endeavors and industries. And it's always, I mean, the benefit of it is that it's easy to be widespread and it's easy to adopt and we create them in ways that are very accessible to a large number of people who don't necessarily understand how that technology exactly does what it's intended to do. And one of the things about that is as technology is going to be able to do more and more, and we're going to see an increase of artificial intelligence and the technologies that everyone is going to be using, that it has to be used very mindfully. And there's a disconnect sometimes between what the developer intends it to be used for or how they intend the dynamic between the human and the device to manifest and the way that it's actually used. And sometimes technology in the wrong hands can be abused by another developer. So once it's released into the world, we don't have a lot of control on it and there's not a lot of ways to necessarily have all the foresight for how it's going to impact mm -hmm. society as a whole. Roman, ask you something. Isaac Asimov, in one, something, an article that he read, of course he's been and dead for a while, so it's not a current article, but made the comment that um, in, in his research at this time, there had never been a technology, there was only one example he could find in the history of humankind of a technology advancement being consciously put aside uh, for the common good. And that was some, they had to do gunpowder. And one of the questions, I think at least history tells us, you know, is it really, I mean, is it really feasible? Do we really think, I mean, what, we talk about these things all the time. Well, it's not ethical, we shouldn't do this, we shouldn't do that. But somehow it seems to take on a life of its own and it just kind of gets away with it. And it's almost as if, if technology can be done, it will be done regardless of whether we think it's good or not. How do you respond to that? Is my mic still on? Just on. Um, so we are actually very successful at controlling a lot of research in, again, spread of nuclear weapons, human cloning. Those are very recent examples of yeah. something lots of people want to do, but we are not. So we have precedent Well, for we're not in certain parts of the world. I mean, there's lots of... Well, we should only care about the parts capable of doing it. <laughs> That's a good point. Yeah. I hadn't thought of it that way. So you don't think, you, you actually are optimistic about that, that piece of it, that you actually think that I we don't need... anticipate North Koreans to develop superintelligence anytime soon. You okay. need computers to do that. Okay. Yeah. He's got a good haircut, though, I mean. Okay. Um, yes. Many politicians do. Yeah. Yes, sir. Hi, uh, my name is Corey. I'm a computer science student. Um, I have it's kind of I have kind of a twofold question. Uh, first of all, um, if you were the one to discover, you know, the the magic algorithm that would lead to the, you know, the discovery of you know true super intelligence, 
you know, you would technically hold that, that magic red button that would release the nuclear warhead, you know, you, you have that, that power, you could be, you know, a hero or an, or an, you know, an evil villain, you know, what, what, what would you do as your moral obligation with that information, how would you go about handling that? And also, if someone that wasn't, didn't have a moral uh, mind discovered that, do you think it could turn into, you know, a, a digital Cold War? So it's the biggest temptation you can think of. You have power to make yourself infinitely powerful, rich. Uh, I hope I'm not the one who has to make that decision because I am human. Uh, power corrupts, and I'm sure it will corrupt me as well. I would totally go for it and be in charge of you all. <laughs> yeah. Uh, immoral people are not even a problem. It's the system itself. It's an independent agent. They say, you know, guns don't kill, people with guns kill. Here we're talking about the gun decides what to do and where to go and who to kill. Yes, sir. Um, Bruce Cohen. I'm in the uh, common sense business. My uh, motto is, it's not rocket surgery. Uh, and I'm a plumber, and I, and I have a hard time understand. I mean, not that we don't use intelligence, but how does that apply where the, ro the robots take over or super intelligence takes over for the, I mean, not just plumbing, but that vast group of people who solve problems on a, like, boots on the ground level? Right, so one of the slides I had was about uh, robot soldiers, and I kind of yeah. cheated. I put also robot rescue workers from DARPA competition, and this year's competition was to go through a building, open some valve, deal with plumbing, essentially, oh. and that was the first year, and first year where they were somewhat successful at actually getting through some obstacles. Then they had similar challenge for self-driving cars. They went from... I don't know how to drive a car computer, to we have self-driving cars in like five years. So we're at like year two right now. I suspect in three years, they'll have plumbers. Is that right? Okay. As long as there is funding, I don't know how DARPA is interested in sponsoring this level of uh, work. If they are, then it's highly solvable. Okay, very curious. I'd be curious to see how that shakes out. So far, we haven't been able to be like, um, we're important because we come to your house, you know what I mean? They can't outsource plumbing. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'll, I'll tweet that, you can't outsource plumbing, uh, I, I like that. <laughs> before, before we get to the next, next question from the audience, I, I wanna turn the subject to this Air France flight. And I said Scott was a 727 captain for a major commercial airline and then flew a 737, which was a much more sophisticated plane. And there was a huge article, um, some of you may have seen it in Vanity Fair about a year ago, about Flight 447 Air France and what happened. And I want you to kind of, if you wouldn't mind, taking us through the, the chronology of what happened with that flight and then a little bit more about what, the, um, what, what was perhaps one of the major contributors to, to that. Well, you know, I'll, I'll kind of take you to the end of the, the, the question that everybody asks, and the, the old line is, you know, the cockpit of the future uh, is going to be a, a man and a dog. Uh, and the, the man will be there to feed and nurture the dog, and the dog will be there to bite the man if he tries to touch anything. <laughs> and, you know, it, it, are we moving towards, towards that reality in a, in a, a lighthearted sense? In the case of, of the Air France flight, um, it is just probably the most egregious of several uh, in the past decade and a half of uh, aviation accidents that have happened because of this interface between the human element and this increasing uh, level of automation. Uh, back in the late 90s or, or early 90s, you had a, a American Airlines 757 hit a mountain in, in Cali, Colombia. Uh, most recently, after the Air France crash, we've had the Asiana flight uh, in San Francisco that essentially just landed short because the pilots uh, apparently didn't know how to just fly a, a visual approach. So in, in the case of the, the Air France flight, you had a, a series of events that like any aviation accident, they always say you never, look for the, you never look for the cause of an accident in aviation at the smoking hole. You always look for it an hour, two hours, three hours, sometimes several days prior to the actual, uh, actual tragedy. In this case, again, it was just a series of events uh, that basically uh, came down to what would have otherwise been a very, very nominal problem being 
uh, iced over pitot tubes, and for those of you, pitot tubes are basically what registers the airspeed. And back in the day of the, what we call the steam engine airplanes, those pitot tubes are directly linked to the airspeed indicators, and if they failed, it was, it was very clear. But in, in this case, with the, all the fly-by-wire things, what you had was the pitot tubes basically iced up and disabled a lot of the automation and took the airplane out of what was called normal mode, which was an automated flight regimen, and into what was called uh, alternate mode, which basically the airplane became an airplane again. And the, the, the problem was di misdiagnosed from the beginning, and without going in, into too much depth, I'll, I'll suffice it to say that if the gentleman in the cockpit at the time had just stopped and watched for 11 seconds, the airplane was fine. There was nothing wrong with it. It basically came down to a mis misinterpretation of data that, again, I would, I would uh, venture to say 20 years ago, 25 years ago, wouldn't have happened. So if the pilot had, if the pilot had done nothing, would the plane probably have corrected itself, the computer? There was nothing wrong with the airplane to start with. Uh, you had blocked pitot tubes. It, it, was a, it was an indication anomaly, but the airplane was flying fine. And again, you know, I, I hate to sound like, you know, nobody likes the guy who always says, well, back in my day. But you know, what we've given up a, a certain tactile relationship with aircraft through all this automation. And back, again, in the day of the, the, the hand-flown airplanes, you would have felt that something was either amiss or the airplane was still flying fine. But they reacted and put the airplane into a, a, a jeopardized situation because they misinterpreted the data that was coming off of these flight computers. Um, one, of the, one of the things that's mentioned in that, in that article, which I thought was interesting, um, they raised the term de-skilling and the idea that um, um, one, of the, one of the outcomes of a lot of the advancement of technology and smart machines is this concept of de-skilling and that is that, you know, we, in a sense, I guess, we've, the machines get far out in front of us and we, we as humans, um, as you said, and that with the air, with the other plane, you know, the pilots didn't know how to, they forgot how to fly the plane, um, you know, do a visual landing, and because it had been done so much automation. You want to comment a little bit on that? Just, I mean, it's not a good or bad thing, it just is. I'll give you a silly example. So I have a book signing coming up. <laughs> I have no idea how to actually sign anything. I, I've been typing my whole life. Mm -hmm. I don't know how to write. I don't know if it qualifies as the skilling, but I wrote a book and I can't write. It qualifies as something. I'm not sure. Uh, I'll give you an X. That's the best I <laughs> yeah. can do. Okay. Okay. But I, I think I'm I mean, worried. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you want to comment on that, Jenny? Yeah. I mean, it, I think it's a it's a real it's a real issue. I, I agree. I think it's very real, and I think it's actually inevitable. So, from a psychology standpoint, we are inherently mentally lazy. And it's, a, it's usually a good thing. There's all sorts of input that we're getting from all five of our senses, and our brain naturally and very impressively manages to filter through all of it and decide how much it's actually gonna process, how much it's actually gonna pay attention to. You have a limited amount of cognitive resources at any given time, and there's multiple things that you have to do. And driving, for instance, or flying a plane, you know? Um, I think Roman had a slide that had a picture of the cockpit how are you supposed to be able to manage to read every single dial at all times? You can't. So your brain naturally says, well, what's the most important part? What, what's out of sync? You know, we, we're wired to recognize patterns and determine subconsciously, before we even start thinking, what we have to pay attention to and what we might actually take in and absorb. So when it comes to a point that technology is able to completely handle something for us, we're not going to think about it. Yeah. I mean, I think we can already see, I mean, how many of, I mean, I'm sure everybody's got smartphones or something similar. I mean, how much information you already offload uh, onto those smartphones and things that, you know, we all used to remember, you know, telephone numbers and things like that, and we offload it. And it seems to me that that whole de-skilling thing, while it's also, you know, obviously has a lot of problems and issues, it also, it, it is kind of a power thing because you're basically delegating to a machine uh, a lot of things that you normally would have would have done. In the case of, of aircraft, I mean, are we, do you think we're really, are we really headed toward, aside from the, just the comfort of having a pilot in the plane, are we headed for 
basically fully automated planes where maybe the pilot literally is just there as a, it is a, a comfort to the passengers? I mean, how much do they fly now? Well, uh, it, uh, a good friend of mine uh, two days ago uh, departed for Hong Kong, 15 hour and 20 minute flight. I asked him before he, he took off, I said, how many minutes will your hands be on the, on the yoke of the airplane? And he said, well, I do it a lot more than most people. It'll probably be between 10 and 15 minutes. Um, and so a, a lot of them, it's four, and uh, these auto, these, you know, digital uh, flight management systems, you can click the autopilot on essentially at two, 300 feet after takeoff yeah, and, don't, I mean, and don't, never touch it in again. The, in the interest of, of flight efficiency and air traffic, I mean, don't they require it? I mean, don't they basically, it's gotten to the point where don't they say, say you can't fly the plane? Yeah, sir, well, and that, that's based on, on air, uh, airspace restrictions. Well, obviously, we're trying to cram more airplanes into, into the same amount of airspace, and so as GPS technology has gotten uh, much more sophisticated, they do say that the airplanes will, f the, 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 the autopilots will fly the airplanes much more precisely than the human hand will. Yes, ma'am, on the left, you had a question? Yeah. Hi, my name is Gloria. I'm a student at Moorhead State University, and um, I find it difficult to wrap my head around or believe that anything that humans make can possibly be smarter than a human. And you touched on that in your presentation. And could you please elaborate on that? Because I can understand a machine being smarter than one person, but not humanity as a whole. Even if they're faster, they're still not necessarily smarter. So do you want to get some examples of yeah, things that's where? Yeah, what I'm asking. Well, first let me just say one thing. Smart's a relative term, right? There's many forms of intelligence. There's, you know, and there's memorization, there's being able to have algorithms, right. there's cre the creative side, the human side. So I think when we talk about that, I think everybody agrees that there are certain things that machines probably will never do well that are certainly uniquely human, no. right? You don't believe that? That's the fundamental point of my presentation. There is no such thing. <laughs> the slides I gave. Super smart, super fast, perfect memory. Every single type of intelligence. Okay, what about creative intelligence? I mean, the ability so to... So creative is human way of saying, I can't consider every option. I'll pick a few, and sometimes I get lucky, and I'm so creative. <laughs> a perfect intelligence, machine intelligence, considers every option and picks the best option. How do we play chess? Until a couple of weeks ago, it was brute force. We consider everything we can 20 moves in advance and pick the best one. Mm -hmm. That's why creative humans don't compete. This guy just got tenure. <laughs> <laughs> just, just to be clear, are you saying that creativity does not exist? It exists, but human creativity is inferior to brute force machine creativity. <laughs> okay, so... <laughs> Easy now. <laughs> Go ahead and answer it. Well, I'm sorry. I, I yeah. feel like yeah. I didn't answer your yeah. question. So take something we all know, Google, right? I guarantee you that Google knows more information than all of us combined. Okay. Well, my, my idea, what I meant by the question was, for example, the grand unified theory of physics. If a machine comes up with it, I think that still means that humans can come up with it because we made that machine. However, the machine just did it faster. Right, so maybe 5,000 years later, we'll figure out something we already have thanks to a machine doing it tomorrow. But you, it's not necessarily going to figure out something that we can't figure out? There are things which are, the complexity of a problem is such that, for example, you need to hold 400 concepts in your head at the same time. We are good with seven. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, hey there, my name is Jens Handeman. I teach computer science at uh, Kentucky State University. I'm not an AI guy, um, however, and um, so, uh, but I'm, I'm a little bit disappointed in you um, because when I started on, on this journey back in, uh, uh, back in the uh, mid-80s, um, artificial intelligence was all about making machines self-aware, giving them um, conscience and uh, um, consciousness. And obviously, um, all you guys shoot for right now is making them ever more complex. And to me, that's just a simulation of intelligence, but not intelligence itself. So how do you stand that? And by the way, when will we have a machine that actually is able to factorize um, two, uh, the, the product of uh, two 500-digit prime numbers? 
So I do that every night. <laughs> You're not going to like my answer, but consciousness is not a scientific concept. It's not something we can detect, measure, or test. It's something you claim you have. As far as I know, you're a zombie. You don't have soul, you don't have anything, you're a machine. There is nothing, absolutely nothing, you will do better or will be able to do if you have or don't have consciousness. It's irrelevant for science. It's very interesting in theology. It's awesome for other things. When it comes to solving problems, actual problems in science, problems in other things, I don't care if you're conscious or not, I care if you're smart. Uh, thing about prime numbers, I didn't quite get it, but I think machines are better than asset factoring. Yes, but you can't build a machine that can do that in the available time that we have for the rest of the universe. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, sir. Um, I'm, uh, I'm Dalton Stokes from uh, Atherton High School, um, and I was wondering, so with the recent developments and breakthroughs in um, 3D printing technology, it's also led to um, engineers creating self-replicating machines. And so I was wondering what you thought that the limitations that we should put on those types of machines, because when you create something like that, there is an infinite amount of um, ramifications that could come of that. Right, so it's a very interesting question. Uh, when you combine intelligence with a 3D printer capable of almost printing all of its own parts and modifying them, you have evolution. You started this process where a printer slowly evolves to whatever it wants to. Uh, we're not quite there yet, and because of you know, scale, need for materials, I think more dangerous situation is nanotechnology, where you have atom scale machines building replicas of themselves, using up all the resources around to build additional resources. And there is a lot of research now in nanotech safety, people looking at it. I was on a panel last week with uh, Eric Drexler, who's the main guy in nanotechnology, and he's working very heavily right now on AI safety and nanotech safety. So you're right, it's related. Yes, sir. Hi, uh, my name is Angelo Stacardis. I'm a computer engineering major from the University of Kentucky. Also, Roman, I just followed you on Twitter, so you're welcome. <laughs> we'll see if I buy your book. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see if I sign it. <laughs> so, anyway, uh, you mentioned that machines shouldn't decide who lives and dies. And uh, I'm just curious, because uh, this past summer I did some work with Toyota on their autonomous vehicle. And you also said that uh, those vehicles will be coming within the next five years. How do you think that we should handle, we as like the people writing the code, what to do in the event when the car is in a situation that no matter what, someone will get hurt? What's the, what is the correct way to go about that? The trolley problem. It is incredibly difficult uh, right now. What we're starting to see, and I'm very happy, uh, companies like Google, uh, Lucid AI, starting to have AI ethics panels basically taking the best researchers in the fields of ethics and trying to address this problem. So right now, the reason we don't have self-driving cars on the street available for sale is because this problem is not solved. Google has them, they use them, but we don't know. Do you kill five women or three children? Like, which way do you turn, you know? It's not obvious, and there are no easy solutions for that. That's why it's probably the most interesting, the most difficult problem in the world. Thank you. Uh-oh, Bruce the plumber's oh, back, he's God. worried. <laughs> All right. All right, now, you know, this is hard for me, but nonetheless, <laughs> if we put all the information that we currently had in every computer that was ever out there, loaded it up, there is stuff that we just don't know, that we probably won't know for a very long time, and that comes from the creativity of our, of our human minds and I have a hard time believing that if you input all this information, there can be that kind of creative common sense type development through in artificial intelligence. I mean, with everything you've got, every piece of fact available in the entire world, there's still so much we don't know. You know, we don't know how they built the pyramids. Come on. So, so what about that? I, I don't know how we build it. I don't know, but I mean, but, I mean what, uh, what, about, what about what we don't know? What about what we don't know 
The unknown unknowns, both positive and negative slides, had a prominent thing. This is exactly, I'm glad the, you can, brought can it up. Can, can, artificial intelligence has a better shot at the unknown than we do as creative people? It, it does. It All has, right. basically, in a time you, as a plumber, will be able to consider three different problems with the pipe. The system will consider three billion. Oh, no, but it's not what I know now. It's the plumbing that is not even, I'm not even thinking about or is not thought about right. or is not there. It's going to be like, you know, uh, in 2087. So what knowledge you know? discovery, data mining, discovery, machine intelligence right, is what machines are beautiful at. Then you have big data, trillions of items, credit card data, airline data, whatever. You throw it at a data mining algorithm. It discovers patterns no human knows about. I think a classic example in uh, sales at the grocery store, you put beer with diapers. That's what people get. Nobody knew that until they did data mining on it. Now then you go to the store, beer is next to the diapers. Actually, that makes sense. <laughs> now it does, because machine told you that. I feel like you're going to be my Joe Plummer. Let me, let me, um, let me ask you another question. I want to, I want to get, I'm going to get into another, another quick question. Um, Jenny and everybody, the rest of the panel. Um, already in Japan, they're developing smart machines, robots, that are somewhat human-like. And people purchase them to help them, to be friends, to be, you know, et cetera, et cetera. We know from, we know from you know, the, way, the way our brains react, when you put a face on something, um, uh, you all know, remember Wilson in Castaways? Remember, you mm -hmm. put a face on something, uh, and, and we, start to, we start to feel differently as humans towards that. And, and so one of the questions is, because it's already happening, are we going to have, I mean, are, it seems to me that there could emerge a whole, I mean, how do we deal with those issues? You know, what happens when someone steals or damages a particular machine that you've had in which your, your, your relationship with that machine is much more, I'm not saying it's human, but it's much more than just your car. Because you've actually had, I know for a fact, I read recently where there was a particular, particular type of robot that I don't know if it was Sony or they stopped making and they stopped making the replacement parts and people were freaking out because they, had, they were like their pets and now they couldn't get replacement parts. Always back up your robot. Huh? Always have a backup. Yeah. Always but back I mean, up it, your it's, robot. It, it, it seems to me that there's going to be a lot of interesting legal and ethical issues Absolutely. as these robots become much closer to us. The interface between us and the, and, and the machines become much closer. As a joke, I mentioned robosexuals, but it's not really a joke. There is now conferences and research on love and sex and marriage with robots, and people are taking it very seriously. It's a huge business. You can buy a very decent-looking fembot for, <laughs> you know... All right, grand. we're going to the next question here. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Hi. Uh, so, the idea that, um, like computational power will continue to increase forever. Uh, that kind of, and you mentioned atom-sized machines earlier, so that kind of presupposes that you could split an atom without, you know, a lot of consequences. Is that something that's already been solved? Like where you can split an atom without like a huge explosion? So there are other ways of uh, harnessing technology. For example, quantum computers uh, probably are the next step in continuing this doubling of processing power. I'm not sure it requires any yeah. splitting of atoms in nuclear type. Well, I mean, like, so... so Nanotech what, what... works at the level of individual atoms. You don't split them, you combine them to form, like, clever molecules or something. Okay, well, because, I mean, processing power is basically how many transistors you can fit, like, on a... So to get more and more once you invent right. it. So, okay. so that's what quantum computers do. They get away from the standard von Neumann yeah. architecture towards something with completely different computational power. In fact, the guy with prime numbers and factoring, it's proven that quantum computers can factor numbers quickly, any size. So that would be solved as well. Okay. And that would take out all the public key cryptography we have right now. So every message you ever sent would be becoming public as a result. Yes, ma'am. Hi, um, I'm Aya Omar. I'm a student at the University of Kentucky. And I have, I guess, a psychology versus technology sort of question. Um, but I actually just finished getting my private pilot's license this summer. So of course, I'm <laughs> in the stage of being simultaneously excited and also freaked out that I'm you know, controlling a machine in the air. 
But I was thinking, and uh, you know, an issue with the freezing of the pitot tube, uh, that is something that I would notice within seconds, just you know, looking at the instruments, and that's not even in the realm of my worst nightmares of things that could happen while flying, because that's a very simple solution, versus you have highly trained commercial pilots that would make such an error just due to misreading. So my question, I suppose, would be in your opinion, would it create statistically safer flights if you had a flight completely controlled by technology like they're pushing for, or simply retraining commercial pilots to focus in on more details and kind of move away from that stick and rudder type pilotage and, and really get deeper into what their instruments are doing and how to handle these crises? If you don't mind me asking, what type of airplane did you get your private pilot's license in? Um, I did a low-wing Cherokee Piper. Okay, did it have glass cockpit or was it? Glass cockpit, yeah, okay. VFR. Well, okay, so there, therein lies the beginning. You look at this, the training uh, progression as rungs on a ladder. And although you have probably spent more time uh, with, as they say, stick and rudder flying in the past year or so, uh, than a lot of commercial airline pilots do. Um, your question as to, you know, would it be better to just essentially make it all automation, which is essentially what they've done now for about 98% of the flight. The question that we have to ask ourselves is, what do you want that 2% time where you need somebody that can physically manipulate that airplane to a point that, whether it's compound failures, mechanical failures, avionics failures, weather, uh, flight physiology, um, that, that can assimilate a broad, a, a broad breadth of experience. And that experience, like as you know, only comes from doing. It doesn't come from monitoring. And so, it, it, you know, I hate to, it, it, always, it always comes back to you follow the money. And how's the cheapest way to train? How's the cheapest way? Everybody in here likes flying, you know, to go see grandma for, for $99. And to do that, it's like everything else in society, there's trade-offs that we're making. Now, the irony is what we've done, there's, there's a, a continuous technological loop involved because when human error has crashed airplanes in the past, what do we do? We've got the technology now to automate that, that error I wouldn't say out of existence, but to make it much less probable. So in, every time you make those, those automation advances, what you're doing is you're now reducing the time that somebody is building that wealth of experience that comes only through doing. And so we get more and more automated. We take the, the pilot out of the loop, but that one or two times that you actually need it or need him or her to be able to, as we used to say, put the, put the airplane in your watch pocket if you need, to, if need be, they don't possess the skills. And that's exactly the, the terminology that you mentioned earlier, the de-skilling. Yes, sir. You had, uh, my name is Alex Day, and you had mentioned earlier, had a slide that uh, a lot of the artificial intelligence research is trying to duplicate or improve the human brain and, and, and how that works and, and how we think. Do you envision a time when artificial intelligence will ascribe any value to a great poem or a beautiful song? So I think one of the things that we haven't yet addressed and our time is running out, but there's a difference between human intelligence and artificial intelligence, and that's holistically. There are some areas where they're just never going to overlap. I fully and completely believe that automating things and putting machines in certain industries are, is totally going to make our lives better. I suck at driving. I really want an autonomous car. All right? You will all be safer. I don't even know if you guys aren't from the state of Kentucky, but you'll all be safer when my car can parallel park itself. <laughs> and I fully admit that. But the issue is that there are so many things, kind of what Scott was getting about, at about human experience and intuition and creativity, I personally think, is a completely human intelligence field. I don't think artificial intelligence has ever gotten anywhere near that. You can simulate it, but I have yet to find, I know, I know, I know, I'm sorry. He's gonna, he's gonna move to the other side of the stage. But, you know, I, I don't think that we'll get anywhere close within the next 10 years to making a machine that can tell a really good joke to make everybody laugh. What, 
his, his intellectual ahead. continuum was very interesting because if you noticed, you know, the, the village idiot and Einstein were very, very close together on the continuum. <laughs> And I'm just wondering, you know, when we get, when, when the machines get to that point that are well beyond, is, are, are these aesthetics that we attribute a great deal of value to, are, are they, do you, Roman, do you envision that there will be value to those? So I'll just tell you facts. I'm not going to judge poetry or art. To me, it's something, I'm a robot, actually. I don't have a soul. So <laughs> one thing I can tell you, and I'm not talking about modern art, modern poetry, the real stuff. <laughs> we, right now, and for the last 10 years, we have machines composing music, writing poetry, doing those things to a point where a human judge cannot tell if it's done by a human or a machine. The Turing test in the limited domain of arts has been passed. We have, we, I mean, we know we've got, and I'm not saying they're good, but we have, we have computers writing articles, right? Newspaper articles, sports articles. So who knows where it's going to end up? Huh? Yeah, I know. Um, those of you who would like to get an X on a book uh, from Roman can be out back. Uh, enjoy the reception tonight, and we'll see you tomorrow. Thank you. <laughs>